This episode of Becoming a Bow Hunter is brought to you by Dog and Gun Coffee. I'm going to cut straight to the chase. You guys can get $10 off of your next order with the code BOWHUNTER, all in capitals, BOWHUNTER. That will get you $10 off your next order over at Dog and Gun. They have mighty fine coffee. They've got some rad clothes. And um, I've heard the hog chockey is it incredible i've not actually tried it myself but um i know people who get through like three or four bags within a month every single month so definitely worth checking out it's dog and gun coffee and you can get ten dollars off with the code bow hunter hey there and welcome to becoming a bow hunter i'm your host maddie and join me and our guests as we take the quality of meat back into our own hands searching the wild for free ranged animals to harvest as ethically as we can. I interview a variety of specialists from the bow hunting community to help fast track your journey as a bow hunter. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this chinwag on one of your favorite topics in the world, bow hunting. Team, we have an absolute ripper of an episode for you today. It is long, so I'm going to keep this short. I'm sitting down with James Doomstis, uh, as he calls himself, the co-host of the episode of the podcast. Um, but James has just done the most incredible trip over to the US, um, hunting elk, hunting mule deer, uh, and this is just a full breakdown, a full rundown of that whole trip. Um, absolutely incredible. He has really kind of tried to paint the picture for us um, from starting it off here in Australia at the costings, uh, what he had to do before he actually set out to do, like the, the exercise and stuff he did into when he got into the States and how he kind of prepared that. Um, really, really great episode, but it also correlates to things that we do here within Australia, like the way that you should approach hunting a new animal. Um, and just an absolute episode, an absolute cracker of an episode. Sorry, it is literally midnight right now. And I'm just trying to get this edited so I can get it out because uh, this is prime stuff and you guys need to hear it. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Guys, welcome back to Becoming a Bow Hunter. Sitting here with Mr. James Doomstis. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me back on your fantastic podcast. I appreciate it. It's um I think, yeah, between you and Grant Randy Rand, we make up one tenth of the podcast, I figured out. I <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm glad you brought that up. I'm thinking maybe some form of, you know, shares. <laughs> for what work? <laughs> Some form of kickback, you know what I mean? Maybe. Um, I mean, I hosted, I hosted one last time we spoke. I that's, hosted you. That's right. You actually did. I think it was uh, second last time. I can't remember, but yeah. See, it's been that many times that I've lost track. How many times? <laughs> I mean, got, guest host. Well, it's got to be something. Affiliate marketer of the podcast. I, I, maybe just a free hat. That's generally. <laughs> the- I'll, I'll get onto some brands for you and see if they can source it. I don't even have my own merch. Mm. I actually got hit up the other day. I've been hit up a few times. Have you got your own merch? I said no many times mm. over because I was just like, you know what? That's just such a nightmare. It's such a headache to actually do that. Um, yeah. Maybe one day. But, um, okay. mate, we're, we're here to – I actually I actually had someone reach out to me and say, mate, you know what would be really cool is to have James on and talk about his whole experience over in America. Um, but first of all, I wanna, <laughs> yeah, I want to have a little chat about it because – I was up in the hills hunting. Um, I was hunting some pigs, chasing some pigs. I don't know if you heard the podcast about this, but we were out in the middle of the field. We're chasing pigs. Um, we weren't really having much luck. There was just so much wind about. We were kind of feeling a bit defeated, sitting up on the hill, having having a bit of a, a uh, feed, having some bars and stuff. And I, it was like the one place on the property that I got reception. So I'm just jumping on socials real quick, and I post up that I was going out. So I saw people would, like messaged me to say good luck um and i jumped on and saw your stories were up and i'm like fuck yeah because i've been kind of following along with the journey as you went um yeah and all of a sudden it popped up that you'd shot this elk and it just like it boosted us up i was like dude james has fucking traveled all this way overseas he's gone on these massive hikes the hikes for days on end and he's gone and shot an elk like we're complaining about hunting some pigs in the middle of nowhere in Australia. Like we've got nothing to complain about. Let's, let's bloody get on our high horse and get back in there. Um, so it pumped me up. It gave me a lot of, a lot of 
like oomph to keep going. I was just so excited for you. But I think what was crazy is um, kind of not only just um, that part, but watching. Oh, you there? Yeah, I got you. Do you have me? Yeah, I've got you. No, I turn off the Wi-Fi because it's been real sketchy. But no, I um, <laughs> it was actually a bit confronting how much support and how many messages and how um, many sort of people tagged along the journey at like different stages um, throughout the whole process. Um, yeah, I mean, it was sort of, I, I guess I was taken back a bit, to be honest, just because, um, I mean, I was like, oh, look, because obviously a, a lot of people probably that listen to this know like Aiden and I have Twin Elements, which is our media company. And um, like often we're out there like filming each other or at least getting a heap of content. Whereas, you know, this time being a new country, new species, I was like, not that the camera was going to be secondary. And like I was I always had it strapped to my hip to document stuff. But it was, I mean, a lot of people probably don't know, but like the way that we normally hunt is like if we can't get something on film, when we're hunting and actually filming, like we won't shoot it. And like, so it's happened. There's been a couple of circumstances that that's happened. And I mean, whereas this trip, it was like definitely hunting first. And I did admittedly try to get my elk on footage, but it just happened so fast that, I mean, I got like, yeah, I got, you know, a bit of audio and stuff, but that's, that's about it. But um, yeah, it, it, it was definitely like, just like, okay, I'm going to make a story and I'm going to share that on Instagram and hopefully people can like, follow along learn something from it and um yeah i mean by the sounds of it they certainly did but i think this podcast is probably going to be better in terms of breaking down logistics the finance like even just i don't know how to hunt elk not that i know anything about it (laughs) um but yeah at least like i don't know just like some things that because it's going to sound like super strange but like i'd like to think that i could go almost anywhere in australia and hunt any of the species that we have and I've got enough of a background knowledge that I can apply basic principles that I've sort of gathered to hunt that thing, I would right? Agree. Yeah. This is going to sound so silly, but I'm like, I didn't even know what elk shit looked like. <laughs> what does it look like, like? Is it much the same as deer? Um, it's like a yeah, pretty much like a red deer shit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, which if you you've done hunting, and that's the thing, like there's a lot of dudes that. And when I say dudes, I mean guys and girls, but um, there's a lot of people that have, they're very good at one thing. You know what I mean? They're, like they're a, 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 a fantastic samba hunter or they're mm, a fantastic, yep. me, my bread and butter is chittle, but it's like, I've also hunted fallow, I've also hunted red deer, I've also hunted, like there's very few species that I haven't hunted and hence like it sort of gives you a pretty strong foundation of like, okay, well, what does that, like I often think of like, okay, what does that animal need? Like what is that animal doing now? Why? Like why, why, why? Like why everything mm. they do is like sit and watch for the bloody house to drag. Yeah. Night. That, like anything, everything they do is driven off survival. So it's like you got to think about that from an animal perspective. But it's like you go to this new place and like I said, I'm like, is that mule deer shit? Is that whitetail shit? Is that moose shit? Is that like, is that skunk shit? Or is that like grizzly bear shit where I'm going to walk and that like, that's fresh and I'm about to walk 500 meters and stumble onto a grizz. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So it's like all this stuff, it's like, is that a porcupine eating that tree? Or is that like a rub? Or is that like a muley rub? Or is that like, you know, because most people, like I said, when you've done X amount of hunting in Australia, like you're like, oh, that's like, you're going to have fallow reds, goats, kangaroos, all making rubs or whatever in the same area. Like, okay, that's a red deer rub. Yeah. yeah. And that's that old, that's a fallow rub. And that's that old, even though you're all here in the same time, same geographical area. It's like, whereas there, I was like, what the f- <laughs> fuck? Oh, God. And it took, even just, oh, even just driving around on the wrong side does of the your, road. Does your head in, right? <laughs> oh, Anyway, but I I said if I did this podcast, I wanted to do it structured so that it could be like a resource for people to Great. go so back to. I actually I- wanted to start before you even left Australia because I think there's, oh. there's so much that went into it before you even so, left the place, right? But, and, right. So one of the first things I want to talk about is, and what I was going to lead in and say is like, because... A lot of people, it's this massive, I mean, it's another country, but it's such a foreign concept, like going mm-hmm. into the US or going anywhere and hunting. And like, I mean, a lot of dudes now are crossing the ditch New Zealand, but it's not that different. And to be honest, it's not a huge, like everyone's like, oh, it's a once in a lifetime hunt. Man, I want to go to Montana 
and I want to go to the US every year for the rest of my life for like whether it be three weeks or three months. Yeah. I mean, like it's something where it's like if you're doing a DIY, you know, there's a group of you over there. Honestly, it's not a once in a lifetime hunt. It's like you could for most average, you know, Australian household people, you could afford to do it every year. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like you've obviously got to save for it and stuff, but I mean like even every two or three years, like a lot of the time you could do it multiple times in your life. And that's something that like, yeah, I guess I want to sort of just explain how to. So like you said, before it all starts with the US, as a lot of people are probably aware, they're not um, privileged to have the system. There's good parts about what we do in Australia in terms of if you've got private access and there's game there, you can go and slaughter every animal there yeah. just because you feel like leave them to lie dead in the paddock. In the US, you've got to have a tag to hunt, right? Whether that be over the counter, OTC, so you just buy it and there's like unlimited or unlimited tags in that area and everyone gets a tag and there's different states that have different rules and we don't have time to go into all of it now, but you need a tag to hunt. So the tag that I had was called a general elk and deer tag in Montana, mm-hmm. right? In Montana, I think I looked up the draw odds ages ago, but to get a deer and elk tag, I think it was about 50-50% draw odds, right, for the combo tag, yeah. which we're going to start writing this down, but I think off the top of my head it was roughly like $1,020 US. Mm-hmm. No, it was Australian. One of the two. Anyway, we'll say it's Australian. I'm pretty sure it was 1000 bucks Australian and like 700 something US, yeah. but... So just say $1,000 or 1200 would you go 1200 bucks Australian, right, for the tag and cool. the applications. Got it. Now, I used a company called Hunting or Hunt and Full, H-U-N-T-I-N-F-O-O-L. There's heaps of different companies. I applied in over 22 states and it cost me over 10 grand Australian. But that's because, like I said, I'm planning on doing this all for the rest of my life. Didn't know the structure of it. Didn't know, like I applied for... You know, bighorn, mountain goat, moose, antelope, muleys, whitetail, um, everything. Yeah, and obviously, how. Deal. Um, in all countries or all different states, sorry, all different areas, different systems, bison, turkeys, all of it, right? So, if you're going to go and if you're an absolute nut like me and love hunting and it's your whole world, even though I've moved to Tassie, which is <laughs> fucked, uh, you, you, Buyers doing something like that, and to be honest, my plan is to do that for a couple of years, maybe two or three years, learn the systems, learn how to do it, and then start applying for myself because there is obviously increased cost with doing it. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know if Craig Hales still has um, something that he was doing and stuff, but if you're just looking right at going and doing a hunt, I can't speak more highly of Montana. So like I said, 50% draw odds, 50-50. All you do is get a Montana registration. I think it costs like 60 bucks for the state or 70 bucks for the state. If you, you then put into draw, if you win it, it's whatever, that 1200 bucks. Yeah. The other the other one is that you can get is you can just get an elk tag or just get a deer tag. Um, you can buy black bear, over, uh, yeah, black bear over the counter, which I think costs like 350 bucks Australian. Um, there's heaps of antelope there too. Um, and then, yeah, so... I mean, if you just wanted an elk tag, I think it increases your draw odds then to like 80% chance. So it's not guaranteed every year, but it's still a pretty good thing. And that's for a general elk tag. Mm -hmm. To get that, you can then hunt, honestly, I reckon, I can't tell you exactly, but it just feels like 50% of the state is public land. Like it's just excessive. Like it's like, I'm probably exaggerating a bit, but put it this way, like there was a whole mountain range that was like, 50 kilometers long where I shot mine, if not longer, that it's the Gallatin range. I'll literally say it because, like, good luck finding a spot. <laughs> um, but, like, the thing is, so, like, you have a look on the map, you're like, oh, that's not bad. And then you get there and be like, holy sh, and just like wrap your head around a tree because, like, and that's just like one spot. Like, that's literally like, there's 50 of those out there. Yeah, like, wow. and that's where local knowledge is so key because they're like, oh, if you, duck up this trail and go up here and then thing. And so if you know people over there, like talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is, um, which we'll get to is I spent so much time e-scouting that was like ridiculous. And I mean, it all changed once I got there, but it's certainly worthwhile having a good mapping software. But anyway, so for that, I used Onyx. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So um, 
but we'll go. So you get your, you put in for your draw, your tags. I was lucky enough in my first year to draw the general deer and elk tag. Um, and then, so what happens is I only didn't, cause I have work, I had work commitments. I only booked flights. Um, so I did mine. A so I was a solo. I, it was a solo hunt. So all these expenses were for one person. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're, two or three guys which i'd recommend because it's probably one of the hardest hunts mentally and physically i've ever gone on mm-hmm. um get into that I'll obviously dive into that but um not only for cost but just like um calling morale um you know like i would have loved a couple like you know yeah like obviously my brother and like a couple of other really close mates like being there like would have been incredible um just because, yeah, like you, I mean, there was a couple of times I was proper down in the pits and yeah. you probably didn't see that on Instagram, like breaking point shit that we'll get into that it was like, was not like, it was like, I mean, we're not recording this, but it was like proper roller coaster up and down. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, big things. So I was, I prepared for, in terms of the preparation for it, um, watched a heap of YouTube videos, spoke to a lot of guys over there. Um, that had hunted it. So I spoke to like um, Nick Morton, obviously, I, he actually lent me a lot of gear too, which um, really appreciate. Like I didn't have, you need really good wet weather gear. You need really good puffy jackets over there. Like I didn't have any snow or anything like that. Um, but it gets down, like it's a different, like in, it's not uncommon. Like there was one night where it was like minus nine. Yeah, wow. And I mean, like during the morning, started hunting it was minus three so they get like in in like october and if you're going if you're a rifle hunter and you're listening to this this still applies to you they've got you know rifle seasons and everything like that but it's like if you're going to go in rifle season like you can get down to minus 20 Hmm. so it's like you need to be prepared like it's not like just going to the high country for samber or the hunter valley for rut or whatever southeast um adelaide you know or uh, south australia for um for hunting down the rut there or whatever, like whatever cool hunting you think you've ever done in Australia or even potentially New Zealand. Like New Zealand is sort of a bit like it, but imagine like just winter. Like, you know, I've never done a pure winter hunt on like the West Coast of New Zealand, but I can imagine it'd be something like that where it's like, oh, you have a great day. And it's like, oh, this is romantic and nice and get some nice photos and, you know, put it as your profile pic for the next three years and et cetera. But <laughs> then it's also like bucket down and you're in a tent for two days being like, why the fuck am I here? And you're trying to think of like playing ice spy through that keeps farting and all the rest of it. Um, so I, the gear, I sort of half did a gear pump, a dump pump, Jesus dump, um, on my Instagram and posted up like a heap of stuff, but I probably don't have time to break down the full gear stuff, but essentially all I would say is maybe we do that in another podcast, but all I would say is I had, gear for day hunts i had gear for backpack hunting i was planning on doing a combination of sleeping in my car and hunting out for every day a combination or like probably in my car oh, i ended up being in the car just because it was easier to roll the pad out and have the pad in the back of the car than keep putting the tent out in case grizzly came and ate me in the middle of the night um and second thing hunting out of a like a hotel room and stuff because sometimes like i'm only hunting like some of the spots i was hunting were only 45 minutes away from Bozeman Airport yeah, well. or whatever. And that's and that's like that's east, west, north, like of of there. Like it wasn't even one spot. There's heaps of spots there. Um but yeah, so one big thing that I was allowed or what I discovered is you are only allowed a thirty two one bag weighing thirty two kilos. So Ian Summers, um, shout out to him, was kind enough to lend me his, um, I think it's like an Everest 44 or something like that. But like I know Easton do a similar bag. It's one of those big made for flying, soft but sort of hard case bags where it's got like hard corners but it's soft. Um, it's got a heap of zipping compartments. So you can put your bow in there and all that stuff. And that was the only thing that fit barely all my gear. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to do like an open to the US, you need bags. No one in Australia had it. Um, at the time, but like I said, and was alluding to with work, I wasn't really organized. My timetable was super inflexible. So I booked my flights a month in advance um, for my flights to and from, it cost me three and a half grand. Mm-hmm. So that the bill, so four and a half Australian, 
but you could get it for so much cheaper than that. Definitely. Like if you if you booked it, you know, like if you booked it, you know, for next, like the, I'm looking at like probably booking it whether I get tags or not to go back and just like experience it all again next year. Um, and so, I mean, I would probably, yeah, like if I book flights now, they'd probably cost me two grand. Definitely. Or yeah. whatever. So just say for the tag and flights, you're looking at two grand, a uh, three grand total or just a bit over. And then I rented a car. So you need a four wheel drive um, just for getting around the, it doesn't it's not like hugely necessary, but I had like a four runner, I think it was called like a Toyota, um, sort of like a bit of a Kluger or a fun, I think of fun. Or June or something. No, they're not fun. Oh yeah, exactly. Um, so something sort of like that. Um, which was unreal. And for me to rent that for 17 days was 1500 bucks Australian by myself. What? That's ridiculously cheap. So if you had three dudes though, three girls, YTG, um, that would be 500 bucks each. You know what I mean? And then I spent, we'll sort of skip forward a bit just because while we're doing the finance stuff, I hope you're writing this all down. Mm -hmm. See you night, you're drinking a cup. You are right, isn't it? Yeah, I've got it all. I'm glad that you know when I take off my time and take off my hosting hat, you, you pick up the slack. That's good. <laughs> um, but I spent another about a thousand bucks in fuel, yeah. and that was pretty. It was, it was yeah, um, it was pretty expensive at the time. And I mean, there were some days, like I said, that I was like, I ended up having a mate that was living in Bozeman, so there were some days that it was just easier for me to go back. You know, do a full day of hunting, drive back, have a shower, repack my stuff, and go out the next morning and do it all again. Yeah, um, yeah. and I—I I mean, admittedly, I also did go and chase after I got my elk. I went, and got, uh, went and did one. I tried to go and shoot a muley or a white, white tail, but and that was like an eight-hour drive across the country for like a two days of hunting because my mate was gone, so we can get to that. But um, yeah, so I mean, your fuel cost would probably be might be five hundred bucks. It's just at mine significantly more because I was doing a heap of driving but either way like if that was shared across a heap of people it wouldn't wouldn't be as wouldn't be significant bad, um but to go back before I even get there I guess I spoke to Nick I also spoke to Robbie Austin um spoke to you know Paul Wood spoke to as many people that would give their time of day about hunting elk um and that's the thing like nothing beats like everyone had different, like that's the same. You put 10 people in the room who are all so-called, you know, red deer or fallow or chittle experts or whatever, and they'll agree on 60% of things. And then for the other 40%, they'll all have their own different theories mm-hmm. and they'll be like, oh, you know, this is the best time and this is the best call and this is how you get it done. And this guy will be like, oh, this is this and this, this, this. And then this chick will be like, oh, and then, you know, whatever. And that, that, that. So it's like, just talk to everyone, you know, whatever. Send me a message on Instagram definitely happy to have a chat if you're going to go there it's like you yeah like you need as much knowledge and that's including like i was reading and watching youtube videos i was reading stuff online i was bloody i sent remy warren a message on instagram being like is there hard copy textbooks anywhere that i can get and start reading because i was doing boat work where i couldn't have internet and i was like i'll read books like i was like watching Jay Scott, he's a guy on Instagram. If you want to go hunt elk or anything like that in the US, he's like probably one of the best educational, I think it's Jay Scott Outdoors, um, educational dudes, in my opinion, on the gram at the moment. He just puts out stuff every day in reels that's like dynamite, scoring animals, where to out of glass, what they're doing now. He's a guide. He also runs a um, uh, like a guiding business, but then also just, yeah, super smart dude. Um, definitely follow him. Like, just people. Like, try and get as much information as you can. What's the success um, rate? Like, it's like really low, right? Like, well, we were gonna. So, I was gonna get to that at the end because I didn't want to sound like a cockhead. <laughs> but so I had a guy after I shot my bull. He got back to me and said he's like on public land to shoot a male elk in archery season. He goes, it's less than one percent. Hmm. There you go. And I was like. That's a pretty nice compliment. That's probably one of the <laughs> nicest. Um, I always knew I was in the top 1%, mum. I just had to prove no. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I was like, wow. I was a bit taken away by it. And, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I met a heap of dudes there 
just on trailheads and stuff talking and I've spoken to a few of them since and like I mean none of them have got it and they're like all locals that have hunted there for years yeah. like even guys are pretty established like a guy that I would now call like a really good mate he's shot five bulls in the last no this year was his six so he shot six archery elk bulls in six years in a row and they've all been over 300 but he's a fucking animal mm -hmm. and I think that's why we got on so well and I was just so lucky to meet him um which I'll same thing I just keep saying I'm going to get to that but um yeah he was awesome dude like just incredible dude um with his time and his um yeah just like opened up his home to me really but he um he helped me a lot and yeah he was probably someone I leaned on when I was like proper down and like struggling because it was just a grind and he was like nah man keep going you'll get there and you know it happened but um yeah honestly not not great but I mean it's not even about like I mean, obviously, we go, we go there trying to shoot an elk or a mule deer or whatever. Um, but I think the thing is, it's not like it's. You see these massive mountains, like it's just Pete. We can't even comprehend. If you've been to New Zealand, they're like imagine the Tar Mountains, except they're not like it's not ice on the top. Well, I mean, sometimes there is, but it's like it's all just forest timber that you can't really glass properly, and there's just like. Like, you just expect that, you know, even yourself, right? You go and hunt red deer at your block, right? You just expect that every hill sort of has, like, at least two or three reds on it and maybe, like, a stack. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, at least a lot of times I hunt have, like, even if they're super low density, like, there's a couple of fallow running around it or whatever. Whereas here, it's like, you could be in a whole basin, right, that's, like, eight kilometres long by two kilometres wide, and there could not be an elk in it. But you don't know that. Yeah. Right. And then you'll walk it all and spend two days there and be like, nah, it's not the right sign. And then you'll move somewhere else. And then what you didn't realize is someone else from the next basin over pushed them into yours. And overnight they walked six Ks because mm -hmm. elk, like I get to see. The, so people were telling me they're like, they will bed like up to six miles away from a food source. Five miles, five miles. So 7.5K. Yeah. Um, which I didn't see, but yeah, they like there's just so many things about them that's different. Like they're not like a fallow or a red where it's like, oh, they feed here and then they move up the hill, which is only like a 300 meter elevation, not even. And then they bed that three quarters of the way up on a little bench and, you know, whatever. Like you've all, everyone knows that yarn. Um, so it's like they – it's not like a red or a fallow that do that. It's like they will feed in the bottoms and then like walk over that ridge, walk down the next basin and then walk up that valley or like start in the basin and then walk up like 3Ks up the gully of it and then walk up two kilometres into the top of the hill and then on top of the bench there. You know what I mean? Like it's not like they're not – they are patternable and they do have like things that they do but in the same sense like, yeah, they can easily – like they just, they're big animals. Like they just cover ground. Mm -hmm. Like it's not even like a thing. And that's like one of the things that Paul Woods said to me is like, if you're following elk, he's like, even if they look like they're piss farting around dawdling, he's like, don't try and like, if they're already like half in front of you, he goes, just try and follow them. Like don't try and cut them off because he goes, unless you've got like this massive like head, um, like that you're ahead of them. He goes like, and there's a short distance, maybe try, but he goes, they just walk so fast. Mm. And it doesn't even look like they're around, but they're just like, they're just going. Just such big long um, legs. Yeah. Anyway, we're jumping head again. I need <laughs> to do this instruction. Look, let's, um, let's go with like, because you were doing quite a lot of training, <clears throat> just actually like pack marching and stuff like that to get prepped. What did that look like? Yeah. Grueling. Um, no, so... I looked up um, some of the spots that I was going to hunt and um, the thing for me was I just wanted fitness to be something I didn't have to worry about. And I mean, I, so for them, I only had, like I said, I booked my flights like a month in advance. So I had a month of training and I went every minimum of four times a week mm -hmm. um, and I was doing backpack training. And so what that looked like was I started off at 20 kgs on my back um, and by the time I finished I got up to 30 
Um, and honestly, I would either go and just climb a mile. Uh, climb a, sorry, guys, I've done like 15 hours of work today. This is words are struggling to come out of my mouth. You're doing um, well. But yeah. Yeah, so I would go. There was a mountain. I was in. I was living in Townsville and still sort of do. So there was Mount Stewart, which was like it was only eight hundred and fifty, I think it was um, feet in, incline. Um, so I'd go and do that, or I'd jump on the stairmaster, which was probably the best thing. And I would just jump on the stairmaster, and I would do between a thousand and two thousand feet of vertical gain, mm-hmm. and that was it. All, it's not about like sometimes I'd jump on the treadmill if I wanted my legs to get used to weight. Yeah. And like so there was one day where I did 2Ks on like the highest incline of a treadmill with 40 kilos on my back. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't even slightly as hard as what it was to do the Stairmaster for 1,500 vertical feet with 20 kilos on my back because mm. that's the thing. Like it's just that like going up. And if you – want to hunt elk and you want to be successful, I mean, you can shoot them off a road, you can shoot them at a trailhead, you can shoot them wherever. But it's like if you want to do a backpack hunt and you want to, like, experience it, there is a level of fitness. Definitely. And that's, like, you know, I'm not here to talk shit and tell you that, like I said, well, I mean, there's, there's a reason that less than 1% one, you know, of hunters shoot a bow on public land, a, a bull on public land every year mm-hmm. with archery gear. You know, and that's the thing. Like, it is... It, like I said, it be physically and mentally harder than any hunt has before. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like that's that was public land, but it's like you know you can also get limited entry spots where it's like you know it's still public land, but you're in spots that there's not eight thousand or whatever the thing is, or ten thousand. I think it is like other hunters hunting that public land around you. So um, yeah, I just I just like I said, I just wanted fitness to not be an issue and I mean to be honest um it certainly there was points that I was especially the pack out was just the most fucked thing I've ever done in my life but uh, it was like I look back on it even while I was doing it now and I'm like it was probably one of the most life-changing hunting experiences I've ever ever done do, and do you I, think you I could have actually already, done anything to prepare for it more though like it, it, obviously if you if you backpacked yeah, every single day yeah. but like in that month would yeah. have you done anything yeah. different to prep um oh i didn't even think about that um that's a fuck you are worth weight and going on you money <laughs> we should keep you around. that's why they pay me the big bucks maybe mate. Maybe me and Grant won't take over the podcast then, I guess. <laughs> Back um, to the drawing board. What would, what would I do different? Um, probably more time. Um, there's a couple of things about the hunting. But in terms of the preparation, actually, this is one thing that we haven't touched on. And in terms of the preparation, I would get better at calling. Mm-hmm. I was I thought I was okay at calling. I still think I'm okay at calling. Um, get Get great at calling before you even get there. Were you just practicing um, in the car when you're driving around and whatever else, pretty nah, much? My apartment. Sorry if you know <laughs> to the people that live around. Like the dogs on the street were like, what? Like just... <laughs> um, but yeah, so I would go at like 10 in the morning when everyone had hopefully left and I would sit there. <laughs> Just with a whistle, just like, like just got a little tongue piece. Yeah, so I had a diaphragm. Yeah, um, yeah, and then Nick, same thing. Like he's Nick and Jack Crick, um, and another Maddie as well. He lent me a Kuyu tent. Like there was a heap of people that just gave me gear in the short amount of time that I sort of had. But yeah, Nick lent me a bugle tube, um, and yeah, I would say order at a minimum, right? And it's so easy to do. But like at a minimum, just go online, order a couple of different diaphragms, different sizes. Like I like the mini ones. Um, I don't even know who do it. And then there's a native one that I end up finding, uh, finding and using. And then, you know, Primos have got theirs and Phelps have got theirs. But just go on eBay, whatever ones you can get, order them, get familiar with them. At a minimum, learn how to cow call, mm-hmm. right? Learn how to bugle helps. Just location bugles. I mean, that's how I got my bull. Um, but also, there are a lot more 
like I, I say, I keep trying to kick it back onto things that people can relate to who are listening. Um, cause I'm assuming you're geographic are mainly like Aussie and New Zealand hunters. From my experience, like reds, those big mature boys don't really want to talk to you. And I've had reds where I'm like, I can see them and you roar and they like, just don't make a noise. Yeah, definitely. Whereas elk, a lot more, like afar, they're a lot more like responsive to you. Mm-hmm. Like they'll, you know, just, yeah, they'll bugle back at you to be like, yeah, I'm here. Like a team buddies like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's probably the one thing I'd do a bit different. I mean, like, like you said, you can always be fitter. Um, but yeah, I would, I would probably just be a little bit fitter. Um, even though I was like adequately fit, just everything, every, every fiber that you're fit up just makes it easier. Um, and then, yeah, just be a better caller. I reckon would probably be the, the thing I'd prepare for more. Um, oh fuck. Really important, which I'll get to buy an e-tag, um, which tells you where your bag is. That'd be nice. That's refreshing. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Pretty, pretty, um, you know, comforting feeling knowing that your bag's somewhere um but yeah so we'll skip forward now i packed all my gears so i had tent sleeping bag cooking gear blah, blah blah bow all that um in my bag that summer's lent me i um got on a plane in melbourne and my flight was melbourne to brisbane brisbane to la la to bozeman montana mm-hmm. and i left melbourne on the 4th of September and I arrived in Bozeman on, I arrived in LAX um, on the 4th of September again, but at like 10 o'clock at night and I rocked up there uh, and my, I'm sitting there at the baggage claim and my bag's not there. And then they had told me that my bag apparently had been left in Australia and that I was flying out to, so I was staying in LAX overnight, um, went and got yeah room and left to go to Bozeman the next morning. And they told me that my bag would be there that afternoon on the 5th in Bozeman, um, because it'd come in on the next flight. So I got to Bozeman, uh, went and got the car, went to, um, this is another thing that not really changed. It's sort of hard for Aussies, but so there's massive hunting shops over there. Like I spent, probably oh, anyway, lots of money on stuff. Uh, a lot of it being dehydrated meals. Um, and then, but I also bought more calls. I bought like a new tri, like lightweight tripod cause all our filming tripods weighed like four kilos. Whereas the one I bought weighed like 1.6 and was designed for glassing and all that stuff, but could still hold a camera and yep. blah, blah, blah. Uh, they're just trying to cut weight there. Um, bought a elk cow decoy, which I didn't end up using, but you know, bought that. Um, Bought one of those new – no, I bought that later on. Uh, what else? Yeah, bought a heap of stuff. Bought a heap of dehydrated meals and snacks and stuff. Um, so, yeah, but what – so big sort of ticket items sell out quick. So when I got there, they'd sold out of backpacking meals in all the hunting shops and outdoor shops. And I was just lucky that I found one that was literally like still packing their – like dehydrated meals from boxes onto the shelf. And I'm like grabbing them off and like, thank you. Thank you. No thank way. you. Yeah. Wow. Because they were all sold out everywhere. I had to wait an extra day just to get jet boil fuel. Cause they're like, we're getting it tomorrow morning. And I'm like, put one aside for me. We'll put two aside for me because that's the thing. Like they all, everyone hunts it. Like it's a massive hunting culture and fishing culture and stuff. And that's their outdoor season. I mean, it's archery season just how it started three days before I got there. So everyone's like, fuck yeah, we're hitting the hills. Definitely. Because I've only got a month for it, right? For archery. So I think the 3rd of September to, yeah, I think it's the 3rd or 6th of October was archery. Mm-hmm. And then there's a week off and then rifle season opens. And then there's a week off and then um, muzzle loader season opens. But that is in um, Montana. Like I said, if you're going to hunt yes, somewhere, yeah. go on up, do it all. And that's where like applying with someone is cool if you want to do like everything like what I've done and you know you're going to hunt in the US forever um if you just want to experience elk and or hunt I don't know you might want to hunt bloody an antelope whatever gets you off like whatever you want to go hunt just like 
find, you know, just do a bit of research, do it online. Like I'd say, don't use like a booking agency or maybe do. And um, yeah, just like apply for a hunt. The other thing that you can just do is like, if you do want it to be more of a once in a lifetime hunt, you can buy like a guide, you know, you can buy like a guide um, plus tag combo in a lot of places, which would be like on private land, really good success. So that's the thing. If you're like some cashed up or more cashed up guy or gal in their forties and fifties and you're pretty financially comfortable and, you know, you just want to go and shoot some big, beautiful animal um, and ex- but still experience it. Like I'm not, you know, just saying it's a trophy hunt. Like it'd still be an incredible experience. Um, you know, it might, and, and you only want to do it once. It might be worth just, yeah, looking at one of those guided tags that also have a hunt. Um, do you know how much more they so, charge yeah, for something like that? No, depends on the outfit. It depends on if it's private or public. Like some dudes guide them. Some people will guide you, but it's on public land. And it's mm-hmm. just that they're like local and really well. Um, some dudes have access to private and you get a tag with it too, you know. So it's all, yeah, it's all different. Um, and like I said, different states, different rules, just, yeah a lot of research and figure it out or just apply for an online platform. But um, anyway, so yeah, I rocked up in Bozeman on the morning of the 5th, went shopping, bought all the stuff, went food shopping, bought, I'd done it. Actually, that's one thing that was worth doing. I hadn't had a lot of experience with backpack hunting. So I spent a lot of time doing backpack gear dumps um, from like, um, you know, EXO guys, bloody Stone Glacier guys, like anyone who'd done a backpack dump of what is in their seven day backpack or whatever, or 12 day mountain goat or 12 day, you know, 16 day big horn hunt or whatever. I watched it. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, then I went and bought a heap of food. Um, I want to touch on this cause backpacking food generally is pretty shit. Um, to be honest, but the mountain house meals were really, really good. Um, chicken and rice was actually pretty good. The brisket, the breakfast, um, skillet was okay. Um, but yeah, they've got a heap of good stuff. Um, spaghetti meatballs, like anything to do with like red meat and sauce and then like a pasta thing. So I was like spaghetti meatballs, beef stroggy, bolognese, like all those were like really good. Um, but it was sort of surprising. Like chicken and rice was really good. That like some weird, like chicken rice stir fry thing that was like half a right. Um, I don't know. They're all like pretty good. But then in terms of like, I carried one of those meals in a day, a backpack, like a, a, um, a, I carried in, sorry, I carried in two of them and I carried in one for breakfast and one for dinner. And then during the day I had just bulk snacks, yeah. right? So I carried, um, I ate a lot of chocolate, um, but I also tried to hit like the most calorie dense stuff, which was fats and protein, or protein for just like regenerative Dieting. muscle. Yeah, definitely. And that's potentially one thing that I'd look at doing. Um, I didn't have room in my thing. Um, but yeah, like um, this is like a shout out to Atlas Wild because honestly it kept me going when I was like struggling. Mm-hmm. Um, especially they're like, so like they, they've got two products and I mean, like I, I'm going to talk about them just because I know it, but like obviously you extrapolate and pull this information as you need it and make sure you got stuff. So electrolytes, they've got fusion, which has like mild caffeine, but heaps of electrolytes and stuff in it. Um, really, really like just never got cramps, never really got that like muscle soreness, Mm -hmm. um, which was like super important. And then rise, which is their like caffeinated, just like stimulated, like focus all day. So I was, I had a three liter water bottle, which I carried in my backpack. And that's what I was doubling down. I'd put one of each of those every morning in there. Mm-hmm. And then that would be me for water all day. Yeah, wow. Uh, so that was, yeah, that was super. And then I also had their like electrol, I just like pure electrolyte sachets, which sometimes at night, if I'd done like a big day where I'd done, you know, like there were some days, I think my biggest day was about 17 kilometers. And it was like, what would that be? So it was like, 6,000 um, feet elevation gain. Far out. Um, like, yeah, just fucking. Is, is three litres of water like a regular day for you? Uh, it depended how hot it was. So over there, because like I said, like the average temp, like so when I'm hunting chittle, um, I drink a lot of water. Mm-hmm. Um, so that 
like I'd drink three liters was not enough. Yeah. Um, to put it to put it frank, so that was me. Like I was stashing water in camp and then filling up as I went. And so like there was some days though, like the reason and when I shot my bull, I dropped down onto water. Mm-hmm. Um, and I down like that's another thing. I dropped down like two thousand four hundred feet. Um to water but i should have just been camped lower um and yeah there's a lot of things that's the thing like i'm not an experienced backpack hunter uh i'm probably not even really that experienced hunter but um it's just like yeah i mean i i think i just ask why and sort of put things together fairly well and that's maybe why i find a bit of success like i'm super critical of like everything i see in the bush and every like i try and think of every an animal's decision and for it to like work out their behavior like i'm a yeah but anyway so I, there was a lot of factors around my backpack hunting and style and all that stuff that would probably make a lot of people cringe um about like how i'd pack my bag and how i'd what i was carrying in my bag and how much weight i was carrying and i don't know yeah but got it done so i guess it wasn't that bad but no, exactly. yeah i, I mean i yeah, I um, there was certainly some stuff that I'd changed about where I camped and how I, the hunting style I had. But um, yeah, I, one the food that I probably enjoyed the most and like never got sick of it was I bought like a big stick of salami, and I'd buy like those cheese um, like cheese pretty much like plastic cheese, not like the slice, but like a stick of it that you give like I remember eating it. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'd eat that and then I'd bought croissants. So every day I'd have like a heat, pretty much a stick of salami, this cheese and croissants. And then to make it even just disgustingly better slash worse, I'd get like a tub of like those little takeaway tub of butters. So while my bag was getting found and delivered to me, I ended up staying in a place that had free breakfast and I was like, yoink, and stole like a heap of butters. from. And so every day I'd have like, a croissant with like an extra tub of butter, salami and cheese. And then I'd have two of them. Um, And I mean, I I was never counting calories, but it was more just like, yeah, just try and like smash as much as I had could do. Did you Um, lose weight while you're there? um, Yes. I didn't really, to be honest, like it's more just like looking at myself. Yeah. Um, Lost weight on my upper body, but I put on muscle and stuff in my ass and legs. (laughs) That was going to be uh, uh, one of the things I thought maybe pre, depending on the person, but it would be worth potentially putting on a little bit of extra weight before you go. So you've got a little bit of extra cushion for there uh, to use the extra energy while you're there, potentially. That's what I tell my girlfriend. I was, um, <laughs> I was, that's why I was, um, I was probably actually carrying a bit of extra weight going into the trip. Um, just but, cause so I did have a, good. I have a fetish for food. <laughs> The European background, you know, fucks me over. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, no, so I, I did certainly lose weight over there. Um, but, I mean, I also was sort of, yeah, it was just weird. Like, I had a weird hunt style where I was, yeah, we'll get to that. But, um, yeah, with the food, I had a breakfast and a night, a dinner of a backpacking meal, and then middle of the day, um, a lot of dehydrated meats, um, a lot of dried fruits, Actually, a really pretty good combo. It sounds super weird. Is um, dried cranberries and dried bacon, which they've got oh, over there. Definitely. Yeah, sort of salty, sweet bacon. Um, yeah, with the cranberries and the stuff was actually like and super calorie dense, like super. Um, yeah, it was actually not bad. It's like the uh, the chief um, bars. Have you tried them? The chief meat bars. They've got that. No. They've got like a, a berry in one of the one of the flavors that they have. That's really really delicious. Yeah, but I mean, that's the thing. You can get some, like, I mean, I probably bought a lot more, like, whole foods in sense of, like, dried meats and all that shit. But, like, there's some fucking unreal, like, I ate a Cliff Bar. I thought it was shit, to be honest. Um, (laughs) I'm proud out of it. I'm like, no, thank you. Um, But, yeah, I had this other thing, which I should have taken a photo of because it was some, like, triple chock fudge brownie thing that some, I don't even know what company it was, had made. And I was like, it's pretty well a heart attack in a brownie but it was like i'm looking at my thumb which doesn't really help everyone else but it's like twice 
twice as wide as my thumb and probably as thick and long, which is probably like two and a half inches long and just say two inches wide. But um, yeah, it was like the best thing I'd, and I'd been saving it in my bag. Cause after I ate the cliff bar, I was like, this is going to be shit. And then I was just eating a heap of that Atlas wild um, chocolate and um, sold to caramel, like their bars, because I was like, at least it's not like, it wasn't like super sweet. Um, and which was sort of like good in the same sense. Um, but yeah, anyway, I had this other, this fudge thing one and I was like, holy fucking Christ. Where, where were you storing all the food? Like were you leaving it in the car and going reloading every few days? Yeah. So it just depends. And that's what we'll get into. Like my hunt style and tactics really changed throughout the hunt. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll get to that. But yeah, so I, um. Anyway, so got there, bought all the gear, slept in a hotel room, spent all night, got a couple of hours sleep, spent all night on the phone to the airline saying, where the fuck's my bag? And no one could tell me where my bag was. Um, the next morning, got up and because I'd arrived on like a Sunday or something like that, the next morning I had to go and get, I hadn't printed out my tags anyway. So I had to go to the thing and get my tags. And this is a thing that I didn't realize. If you want to hunt... Um, with archery gear, you've got to do an online course in Montana. I thought you just bought like a ten dollar license, but you've got to do a course first. So my one, oh, I'm on my phone. My one, I think I can't remember what. There's a state. Ah, Jesus! Wait a sec. Anyway, wait. Um, what's his name? What's his name? This is awkward because everyone's waiting for me. There's a state. Anyway, I'm pretty sure I want to say it was, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. It'll get there. It wasn't Wyoming. Anyway, there's one state that they recognize. It's not Nevada either. I just do Nevada, which was like a training course, but that was just for applying in Nevada. Might have been Colorado. Anyway. There was one state that you have to do a bow hunting and then they acknowledge that course and then that's when you get it. Anyway, it takes so long. It took me like five hours to do because oh, there's no. a timer on your course. Um, like you can't just go skip, 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 skip and then get to the end and answer it. You've got yeah, to like... actually watch the videos and shit. Every page, it's like a minute. And so I just like skipped it and sat there and then like skipped it and sat there and sat there. And anyway, so you got to do that. If you're going to hunt archery, do it before you get there because it's just a waste of time. Um, but yeah, so I got my tags and then i went back to the shop to get jet boil fuel and i'm sitting at the archery shop and i'm on the phone to Qantas, who was my airline i wasn't going to rub them through the dirt but it slipped out so here we are i was flying with Qantas. And bag. um anyway so they lost some bags i was on the phone to them for two hours on hold as classically you would be and this guy got out of the car and i just stared at him because he was wearing full camo and he got out of the car his truck they all drive trucks over there they all drive on the wrong side of the road. And the other thing I'm going to add is if you're in the far right lane, they, they drive on the right-hand side there. If you're in the far right lane and you pull up at a traffic light and you're turning right, you can turn right at any time, even if the traffic light's red. So that's something I learned, right? The other thing is they drive signs, very... Don't they? Like turn right at any time with caution? Yeah. No, they don't have those signs. <laughs> Use error? took me a lot to realize that well, it took me a day the other thing was they drive very quick which is good on the highways they're driving at like 100 or oh, it's meant to be like 90 miles now which is like 140 but you know, everyone drives 100 miles now so you're driving like 150 on the highway so you get like quite you get to go quite quick um but anyway so yeah that was interesting about the cars um and then yeah so I'm sitting in this car park and this dude walks out in camo and I'm like sitting there staring at him and he's looking at me. And afterwards when we spoke about him, uh, spoke about it, he thought that I somehow knew him. And he's like, fuck, I don't know that dude. <laughs> anyway, so then he's walking and I'm on the phone to Qantas and I was like, nah, I need to know what's happening. So I hung up on the Qantas person um, and I was like, oh, hey, man, how's it going? He's like, yeah, good. And I was like, you've been hunting today? He's like, yeah, yeah. And then anyway, so we're not talking for like 45 minutes and little would I know that this probably honestly changed my life, that conversation, but this dude like opened up his home to me and he, well, he's got a partner. He hasn't got a family, but all well, his family, I guess, and his doggos. But like I ended up staying at his place. We shared hunting stories, 
at hunting spots. He helped me pack out my elk. And, um, yeah, after the first day that I was like, first time I met him, he was like, Oh man, like, he's like, look, if you can't get a bow, he's like, I can't hunt during the weekdays anyway, cause I'm working. So he's like, if you want to take my bow, hmm. he goes like, just fine. And I was like, fuck, that's like a pretty nice gesture to some bloke that you just like met in a car park. Definitely. And, um, yeah, he was like, I sort of thought about it afterwards and he's like, yeah, but you just seem like a pretty trustworthy dude. And like, you seem to be like super passionate about it. And he's like, I can just imagine if I'd like, you know, gone to Australia and like, you know, you'd met me, he goes, you probably would have done the same thing. I'm like, yeah, that's probably true. Like, you know what I mean? Or like, I'd at least probably just be like, Hey, let's go hunting together. It just shows Um, like the, the bow hunting community, right? Like it really is. There's something a bit different, something a bit special. Oh, like he just yeah we got and because i just said to him like hey can i just ask you like a million questions um and yes yeah, so i just started like absolutely just dribbling out like tell me this tell me this and probably like now where everyone's just going what the fuck james can we just have a please a bit of structure to this podcast <laughs> please just like structure a question in like a literate and like audible way that like I can somehow answer it so that you get something out of it because you've asked me about 45 questions in the space of 10 seconds and they're all like, what about this? What about this? And blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, I thought that. And, blah, 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 blah. and then anyway, so we spoke and then he had to go. Um, cool dude. I'm not going to say his name because he's got no – well, I mean, he's got no socials anyway, so he'd probably never find out. But legend of a dude. Um, and, yeah, I then – went you know what fuck it and so i go i'm gonna drive to the airport and i'm gonna go talk to someone at the airport so at a minimum at least i'm talking to a human yeah because call i mean i like i I would have spent in that 20 between getting and landing in boston and i'd say flight if you're going to hunt Montana, I'd say it's worthwhile flying into Boston because there's so much good hunting access within like two to three hours from there and it's just easier. Um, I know Jake Gasparos, Jake, uh, Gasparowski and a few of those boys flew out from summer, I think Helena or is whatever, which is the capital. Bo- Bozeman, not Boston. Not Boston. Bozeman. Bozeman, B- yeah. yeah, yeah. B- M-A-N. Um, yeah, so – um, yeah, fly into Bozeman and hunt from there because it's just more central to the hunting and stuff, whereas Helena is, like, a bit further away. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, whatever the thing is. Um, but, yeah, so then I went to the airport, rocked up there, and um, my bag's sitting there. And she was like, oh, is this a bag? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, oh, we didn't know what baggage claim, like, to put it again, so whatever. She's like, we, knew, we didn't know whose bag it was. And I was like... I've been on the phone to your company and Qantas for like, fuck, I can't even tell you how many hours. Like, and I'm like, how? Like, no one could even. The thing that got to me was, and this is where the air tag or air bag, whatever it's called, would have worked, is like, I didn't know where. No one could tell me if my bag was still in Melbourne, Brisbane, LAX, or Bozeman. Like, isn't no the whole one. point of the tickets they put on them? Like, the little strips they put on whole, to scan? Yeah. That's the whole thing. But no one, like my bag had just gone MIA. Like no one knew, as far as they were concerned, I hadn't got on with the bag and it just poof, poof, just hit. <laughs> Fuck. What a nightmare gone. when you're there. You're like, oh, isn't that like just so anxiety driving? Well, that's the thing. And because the thing is, it's not even like, oh, you can just like, oh, your bow's not there. It's all good. Like you can just go and start. Like I had everything in that bag, mm-hmm. like everything. Like my boots, my actually I was wearing my boots, but like you know all the hiking gear, all my hunting gear, all my like backpack, like everything was in that bag. So it's like you can't even. It's not even like oh, if my bag never rocks up, hey, can I borrow just your bow? It's like I need your binos, I need your backpack. Like okay, it means I can. But it's like like he goes. He said to me, the guy, my mate. He goes, what do you need? And I'm like, honestly, like everything. But I'm like. I'd probably be able to improvise and just work on if you gave me a bow. I'm like, honestly, I've got boots. I've got a bow. I'm like, I could probably just buy some camo. Like, oh, I'll give you some camo. I'm like, hey, cool. I'm like, look, binos would help. But, I mean, if you haven't got extra binos and shit, like, I'll just, like, wing it and just, like, be the most rogue, like, under-equipped guy ever out there. But I'm like, we'll try. I, I mean, you've got, I've got to try. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'm here. Like, even though that's, like, you don't know anything about the animal. You're in a new country. You've got to like try. And so that was the thing. It was like, I don't care if my shit all doesn't rock up and I've 
got to like half buy new stuff and half it's like I'm going to get like it was like in me from the start that it was like nah like we're not like this is going to happen like you're going to you're going to do this and yeah so as soon as I got my gear I then just went what I'd done is and this comes back to the e-scouting stuff so Nick had given me a couple of spots um, that he'd been to previously but I was hunting solo and the spots that Nick gave me was between like six to 15 kilometers back into the back country. Mm. Right. And so I'm like, if I've got to carry an elk out by myself from 10 kilometers deep, I'd potentially die. No, I wouldn't die, <laughs> but it right. And so I scared. And the thing is Nick's spot, I can tell you all these details because yet again, there's like millions of acres of country out there. Nick's spot works because what happens is it's like the basin that's in the center and there's no trails or anything going into it. So you've got to backpack hunt into there, mm-hmm. right? It's where the it's where the guides go when they, they walk in on their mules. Now, if they walk 12 kilometers back into there and set up camps yeah. is where we like where, where I shot my elk essentially. And the reason they go, all the elk go there is because – all the people hunt from the trailheads, and all the dudes. What did they call? There was a guy that I met that called. They called it something. It wasn't the. It was like the shithead range or something. They called it where it was like anywhere two miles around like a trailhead is like where the day hunters hunt. Yeah, got you. So two two miles off a road or a trailhead is like the shithead zone. Essentially, is what he was calling it, and that like all the. And then there's like the ten mile back zone where a lot of. Um, like, yeah, guides and, you know, outfitting camp set up. And that's where Nick was sort of hunting. Because I was hunting by myself, I was a bit scared of going there and having to pack out an elk because it was just intimidating. Like, honestly, you don't realise how big these animals are. And the second thing is you've got, like, a legal obligation to, like, go and get all the meat out. So you have to take all four quarters, the back straps. You don't have to take the the rib meat or the neck meat. Um, But, yeah, so it was back straps and all four quarters, which, I mean, like, the hind legs – one hind leg chopped off at the hock with – we actually, no, we ended up boning them out, weighed like 37 kilos. Far out. Bone out. So, like, well. yeah. That's crazy. Like, boned out meat, you end up carrying out about – That's like a fallow 100. deer. That's like literally carrying a fallow deer with his guts out. Yeah. Yeah, that's intense. <clears throat> so, that's the thing. Like, and you've got a legal obligation to carry that, that meat out. So – if it's, you know, you can do everything right, gut it, hang it, like, or quarter it, you know, have the game bags, hang it. But if that meat spoils, like, I mean, no one's ever going to find you and be able to prosecute you for it. But, like, it's just, it's also, like, morally, like, just trying to do the right thing. And, like, you, mm-hmm. you're hunting in a new country, so you respect their rules, I guess. And, um, see, I was just a bit conscious of that. And, like I was saying, Nick's place works because – the hunters push them into the back country, essentially. Yeah. Yep. The other hunters push them into the back country. And so I um, I was like, well, it's only the fourth day in the season, so they haven't really had that pressure yet, you know what I mean, to push them back mm. to where his prop like, part is. Because that's the thing. They get pushed around so much. Um, and anyway, so I'd marked out a heap of spots that were day – spots where it was like okay park here walk into here check all this out and stuff and blah blah blah. and so i had like create that's probably one thing that i would i'm going to do better next time and i'd suggest is like if you've never been there have no spots anything like that scout a heap of stuff be really critical and have a hunt plan where it's like okay this is my first spot a Go here. Does it look good? Am I seeing elk sign? Am I not seeing elk sign? Blah, blah, blah. If, it, you know, if you're not, move on. You've got to pack up camp and move on. Like, don't be stubborn. Don't go, oh, no, nah, fuck, I scattered here and it looks great. And this is a great basin thing. Because there's so many people that do that and they just don't see elk. They don't shoot elk. You hear it on time. Like, I, some of the, Remy Warren was saying on one of his podcasts that he walked into an area because he thought it was good, went there, checked it out. And they met some guys and like, oh, how long are you hunted here for? And he's like, oh, this is my seventh year hunting here. And he's like, oh, how many bulls have you shot in here? And he's like, oh, we've never even seen a bull. We've heard one bull bugle. <laughs> Fuck. You know what I mean? People, oh, oh, this must be great. 
Yeah, that's just ridiculous. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Whatever. But that's the thing. It's not like here in Australia. It's not like, oh, every mountain has elk on it. Not It's like there will be elk on that mountain and then you'll scare them and they will be whatever, five kilometers away on the next mountain. Yeah. Like, like it's not like where the density is super, like they travel around in a mob of like maybe, you know, whatever, 10 to 30 animals. And so like in that basin, that massive basin of country, there might be 30 animals, but they're only in two spots and then there's satellite stags around them. But it's not like where there's like mobs of two and three and two, 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 like here and like, there's just like this blanket of animals across the land. It's like they're in pockets. And so if you're like, you can be in somewhere that looks incredible, but there's not elk there. Mm. And so that's where you've got to have like, like that I had a hunt plan. And so I walked into an area, right, that I thought was going to be awesome. It was all um, what I'd done is because I thought, because it was early in the rut, I thought the bulls are going to be like transiting into the cows. So I found all these like high ele- elevation lakes where I'm like, because it's going to be coming out of summer and into spring, they're going to be hitting wallow uh, into autumn. Sorry, they're going to be hitting wallows. They're going to be chasing feeds still, like they're not going to be super pent up yet. And um, yeah, so the first spot I walked into, walked into there, like I said, I didn't know what an elk track looked like, didn't know what an elk shit looked like, didn't know what an elk rub looked like. Um, in hindsight, this is how I would do it. When you're e-scouting, right, find meadows because elk are really dependent on, they do browse, but they're really dependent on grass, right? So in those really thick timber forests, like an acre, uh, an acre, like a football, an AFL football or a rugby football field size of grass is like, Super, super valuable. Yeah, got you. The next thing that you're going to do is when you're e-scouting is look for benches. If you don't know how to use a topo map, sit down, watch a couple of YouTube videos, learn how to read a topo map. It will save you hours of walking around the bush, aimlessly looking at butterflies and trying to figure out what shit it is like what James did. Yeah. Right? <laughs> What you need to do is, right, they're like red deer. They like to bed on benches. Mm-hmm. They like to be comfortable, right? So look at a topo map and you'll be looking at a ridge and all the lines go across the ridge and they're all flat, flat, flat. And, you know, if they're really close together, it's really steep. If they're further apart, it's a bit more benchy and a bit more sort of gradual incline. Yeah. But what you'll see, you'll see mm-hmm. like halfway across a ridge somewhere, there'll be like a W, something like a, a little – where it's sort of it's a straight line and then rather than being a straight, 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 it goes like it goes straight and then has like a little bubble and then goes straight again. Mm-hmm. And that's indicating that on the bench there's a bit of a flat uh, on that like on that hill face, right there there's a bit of a flat spot. And so then what you can start doing is you can start pinning water, you can start pinning um bedding areas, you can start pinning these meadows and you can work up an area before you've even got there. Right? And I mean, that's the thing. I did that with a few spots. Now I know how to do it even better because I've then gone there, seen what the animals do and how they act and where they sleep and all that stuff. And then I can even further, you know, do it. But I mean, those two, between those two points, meadows, number one, biggest thing, work out where they're bedding. Honestly, you can like plan a whole hunt and scout a heap. Like I've got, there's about six spots that I found off maps. I didn't even end up going to right that in i think could be really good mm. but i've never been there but just it's purely because after i did the hunt like the week after i got home i just sat there and just went fuck this cool fuck. Boom, 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 boom. dropped a heap of pins and then i just had like a, a different so this is what i'd like a green and red pin set up so i'd drop like a red and with onyx so i was using onyx um um i could flip between in like 2D mode, 3D mode, topo hybrid mode. And then I could have, you had different like, um, like you had a pin for feed and a pin for, you know, I've seen elk here and a pin for, there was a rub here and a pin for, I finally worked out what elk shit looked like and put a pin on it and blah, blah, blah. You could pin everything you want, like yeah. water courses, all of it, right? So I, the main ones that I was pinning was if I found a new spot, I'd pin them all red mm-hmm. and then there and hunted, I'd change it. Either, if 
I confirmed it and went there and I'm like, fuck yeah, it's an awesome betting area. They then become green. Yeah, cool. Right? And that was just, right? And then you use the different single symbols to say watercourse bedding area, you know, rubbing area. Like, because sometimes you'll find like a really nice corridor full of rubs and you're like, okay, well, this is worth pinning because it's like obviously a natural corridor. And like sometimes it's only a small different, you know, just like a dull elevation change in the land that makes it like a saddle that's easier to get through. But it's like, oh, you know, it just helped. More knowledge is power. And for me, it was like I was a little pin slut where I bloody <laughs> drop pins on everything. It, uh, I just found it easier. You know, it just helped me to be like, oh, there's elk there and I've got a pin. Like I found elk and there's a pin 800 meters away and they've just walked off this meadow and they're walking in the exact direction of where I think they're going to bed because I've already dropped a pin there. Did, did you know, you know what I mean? like, did you get told this before you even went though, the meadows and the, and the, um, so I, um, all sort of like people said, do it, but like, I didn't, I'm sitting here trying to emphasize to people like people go, Oh, find meadows and find thing. It's like, no, no, no. Like really guys, you guys who are listening right now, find a fucking meadow. Mm. Like that is the number one critical thing. Like don't look at the mountains and try and find bedding areas first and try and like look at mountains and like, you know, work out the shit, go on Google, like um, Google earth, satellite imagery, find a meadow, then plan everything else around it. You know what I mean? Like they are depending on grass. They will walk five kilometers easily overnight to go to a good feed of grass, whether that be ag, ag, like agricultural grass or whether that be, you know, this big meadow that you've found in the back country, Mm -hmm. find a meadow. Then go and check the first thing that you, the first thing you're going to do when you go hunting there is go to the meadow and go, Hey, is this a good meadow? Is there rubs around it? Is there shit on it? Can I see beds on it? You know what I mean? Like, cause I'll bed on the meadow. Yeah. Like, but like, is the whole reason why I'm here, is there elk sign on this thing? Ha, okay. Yes, there is. Then you work out, well, how recent is it? Because they migrate through those. Like that, that's another thing that was completely different for me. Because of those 20, minus 20 degree winters, they have full migrations where elk, whitetail, mule deer, all of them migrate from such and such in the high altitude stuff down to the low ag country because where they where they live in the summer in winter freezes on the tops and there's no feed yeah so it dries so that's it's so like new concepts and stuff so it's like you see rubs and stuff and then or or even tracks and you're like well is this track fresh or is this track you know and that's one thing that is sort of different like i mean i've done it you can smell buck piss you can smell reds and stuff but like with elk you can smell them and you can smell where they've been, especially like the bedding areas. And so like, if you're not smelling elk, it's not really that fresh. Mm -hmm. My opinion. Um, I found one spot. So my first day I went to a spot, I saw a mute, like walked up this, I did a big, like I was going to say, so everything over there, sometimes I'll use miles and that's just because I was over there. And it's just how I spoke and that's sort of half how I think about it, to be yeah. honest, as now, as now, which I, I mean, I realized I was one of those guys, like, oh, fuck, just say it in kilometers and say it in, in centigrade instead of Fahrenheit and stuff. But it's like you go over there and you just start like talking their language because that's how they oh, talk about they, things. They, they won't understand you, right? You just have to. Uh, exactly. So, um, yeah, like the first day I was there, I did, it was like an eight mile walk. So it was like a 12K walk. I walked up a trailhead for four miles, so six Ks, and then did another about, um, I'll say mile and a bit, so two Ks up the back. Um, And, yeah, went and had a look at all these lakes, and it was cool. Like there was, um, saw a muley, ended up seeing two bull moose, which was bloody awesome. Yeah, got in really close. Yeah, got 15 metres off them. God, would have smacked. Well, I mean, they were only babies, but... Um, huge animals like would weigh even as like I reckon those animals would be like, like a year and a half to two and a half years old and they would have easily weighed oh, 600 kilos far out just real you think about like a yeah that's like a, a decent sized cow like a cow when it goes for the feedlot not when it goes to the um, kill I mean the slaughter big animals yeah just real tall leggy Super, like, 
I mean, I had two in- interactions with Moose, so I'm like hardly have any form of opinion, but weren't, didn't seem super intelligent, um, really poor eyesight. They can hear, but they can't see. Mm-hmm. So weren't like the most, I think like shooting on with a bow, I don't think it'd be that hard. I think it's more the challenge of like finding them from what people have said. And then the second thing is like just a sort of like killing a buff or a scrubber, like just the physical size of them. They've got yeah. a lot of blood. Yeah. Like, you know, you got to make sure you shoot them right. Um, but beautiful, fascinating animals. Like, and it was, and I think that's part of the the cool thing. Like, I, I keep going back to it. Like, not knowing what shit looks like. So, if you imagine like that, and then like extend that out and extrapolate that out to being like every animal. And like, I'm me and Aiden geek out over like lizards and shit. So, like, we're super passionate about like all wildlife. And so, like, it's like, holy fuck, what is that animal? That's sick. What what is that? Like, what is that? Oh my god! Like you're just walking around, like this is the best thing in the world. Kid on Christmas, yeah. Um, oh, proper, like just walking around and like and um, yeah, seeing all these different stuff and and just oh man, just takes my breath away thinking about it. But just so beautiful, like just sit on a log and just feel like just that nothing could ruin that moment mm. you know what i mean like just, yeah honestly was was that like, at least something that kind of um i guess kept you somewhat level headed when you had those really hard days um yes and no like it was all the i think i think it's just because the reason why i was getting frustrated was because you're trying to piece something together. You're trying to draw a picture and you've got two tiny piece of, pieces of the jigsaw puzzle figured out. You know what I mean? Like like I said, you see them leaving this feeding area and going to a spot that you've got pinned on a bedding area and, yeah, they go there. But then halfway along you put them up because you don't listen to Paul Woods and you try and intercept them and you scare them, right? And then they disappear and they just go poof. And then you go, oh, you know, like you're used to hunting reds and fallow in Australia. So like, oh, they couldn't be that far. And like, I mean, they might not be. They might be on like a different meadow or they might be in the timber two k's away. But I mean, they also could be in the timber seven k's away. Mm. Like that thing, like the, the, the mountains over there are just massive and it's just hard. And yeah, like it's, it's sort of weird because I keep talking about it like it's this impossible task and i mean it's hard i'm not gonna lie but in the same sense it's like probably one of the most like i said it was probably one of the most life-changing and rewarding hunts i've ever done because like you get to the other side of it and i mean like i wasn't ready to go home like i was, like, I was only there for yeah two and a half weeks and i was like fuck i could be here for three months like yeah. and not even like, not even like um you know not even personally like I had a deer tag, which I didn't end up filling. And I mean, like to say if I filled that, I would have just loved to have been and just lived amongst the elk and like I got to hang out with more muleys and like, you know, probably just try and stalk some antelope. And like, you know, there's just so much, even just like driving to the hunting spots, there's that much um, people using fly gear for fishing for trout, you know, like there's a culture and the atmosphere. It's all just like, it's beautiful. Like it's, yeah, it's sort of, it's inspiring really. It's probably how I'd put it. Like it just really, like I've been doing a lot of filming and so I'd probably lost a bit of my, not lost my way, but I just, I was a bit uninspired about hunting. Like before I went there in the sense of like, I was still doing a lot of chill hunts and like, um, yeah, I mean like I was, it was very repetitious Mm. what, what I'd been doing. Um, and I mean the Argentinian hunt was really cool. Um, earlier this year but I mean I'd hunted I've still hunted reds a few times and whereas this was just something that I think it was like it was like the first time I went to New Zealand where it was just like unlimited kilometers to hunt if you want to walk 30 k's just for the fucking sake of it go on man go walk 30 k's like go do it go die like go do it it's just you've got unlimited land you go as hard as you want you can just explore. It's just, it's just, yeah. And I just got this 
and this is why it's weird that I've taken this job that I've taken because I'm like I've never felt more inspired to hunt in like probably the about last four or five years is what I do now. And you're in Tassie, you know I mean? of all places. And I'm in Tassie, working like the worst roster I've ever <laughs> got. But yeah, so it was just yeah, it was weird in that sense. But um, I don't know, like I, I just love it again. Like, and I just can't wait to do it. But now for the next year, at least I probably won't be able to doing it that much, but yeah, it's just, it's just incredible. So, but, um, yeah, walked around, I keep, I'll try not to dawdle. What's, how long have we been doing this for now? Uh, hour 17 already. I, I feel like oh. there was, <laughs> there was, um, there was definitely a part where you came across elk pretty soon in, right? Like you came across some yeah. elk and there was like a thousand people around you. Yeah. Well, that was the second day. Yes. So, so this was the thing. I like, I walked this massive, right? And this is like adapting to the plan. One of my hunting spots. So the spot first day did this big twelve k walk, um, and yeah, didn't didn't um, see any elk. Didn't really see any fresh sign. And I was like, no, nah, righto. And I was like, you. This is what I, this was my thinking. And I was like, you need to increase how far and how much you can see, right? So I got up for first light and I, what I did was I just got on the road and I would drive, I drove on the road and I was glassing all the open tops Mm -hmm. and everywhere that was open that I could see into, I glassed, right? And so I just covered Ks, like I'd just do like two Ks, come around, like because it's all really high elevation, like roads on the side of the hills and uh, so roads on the side of a hill or cut into hills and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just get different angles of different ranges and like work my whole way down this massive like 20K basin, right? Essentially was my plan. Because I'm like, it's got, it's all just thick as fuck timber that you can't really see into or can't even, you can't even see 10 feet in it. You know what I mean? So it's like it, being in it, if they're not making noise, doesn't help. So I'm like, what I'd do is I'd pull up, I'd glass and be one, uh, sorry, I'd, I'd bugle and be one of those dudes off the road that was bugling, which I mean, can work in can't work i guess but it's i mean it's just a tactic that i was using because i didn't know what to do mm-hmm. and i was just hey let's just mix it up you know what i mean so anyway i was glassing off the road and ended up seeing a mob of elk herd of elk herd of elk um up on top of this ridge and i'd driven in that day that way the day and a half before or like the night before or the first day so this is the second day now and i would have passed 30 dudes camped and i was like they're standing on the highest fucking ridge in the open like how has no one <laughs> seen this? like how has no one seen these out and it's like it was the even wasn't even that like it was like half an hour after light you know what i mean like it wasn't like they were clearing off you know in the beautiful gray light it was like the sun was up peeking over the ridge and these things are like sitting in the paddock that I've spotted them from like five Ks away with binos. So I'm like, like I said, open paddock, open hillside or top of a hill. Yeah. So I fang it over there like proper no access. You pay for the no access part on your hire car. That's what you do. Um, Got over there and I parked on like a camp where there was someone camping the night before that I'd got in there and it was 300 meters from the elk. And I was like, put up in the car and I was like, I am fucking way too close to these things. And anyway, so I got there and then I parked the car and looked up on the hill and here's this herd of like 10 elk. And there was a little rag, what they call raghorn, which is like an immature bull. And he was a young five by five. I think he was probably two and a half years old. He might have been oh, 30 inches long sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, or like a year and a half old. If it was, I don't know. I don't know how to age out. But Pause he was there. Like, Did you go over like what was the standard that you were willing to take? What was your your but your minimum bull that you would take? Mature. Yeah. I want thing, and it's still that. I want something, so that's – I was actually talking to Craig about it last night um, because, um, yeah, a lot of people go, oh, no, man, I'm only shooting a 350-point bull or bigger. And then they see like a 260-point bull. It's the same with me guiding chittle. Mm-hmm. Everyone, I'm shooting a 30-point, 30 30-inch 30 chittle, nothing less. You go, righto, kingpin. 
And they see the first like 22 inch chill and they're like, oh, fuck, how big is he? Can we shoot it? And it's like, well, I mean, yeah. But like, typically we go for something that's a bit bigger. Like, you know what I mean? And that's the thing. Like, you've got all these people that read something in a book or some pleb reads it off Instagram. Like, no, man, I'm only shooting this monster buck, monster deer, and I'm going to do it within a, tr- a mile off the trailhead. And, you know, I'm going to sleep until 10. Um, like, yeah. So all these people have these like wild ideas. And they see a bull that's like mature and they're like, oh, fuck. You know, and then they, yeah, they shoot that and then probably shoot that every 10 years. Like, or they'd be happy to shoot a raghorn, like a lot of them. Um, like a lot of the, it's different in Australia. Like we hunt a little, probably more for, like I say, I hunt for meat and trophy, but obviously that hunt being in the US, like I gave all the meat. So it was mainly for trophy. But um, yeah, over there, they're completely different. Like a lot of the dudes are just trying to fill the freezer. So if it's got like a fork in a sound, like they're like, I'm going to kill it. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me personally, my thing was like, I just want to shoot a mature representative elk. I didn't like, even that the other day, my mate messaged me and said, Hey, do you want me to get it scored? And I said, honestly, I don't care. Yeah. Like it doesn't, it doesn't like, I'm not really no into the whole, yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not, um, it's not because I have nothing against scoring animals, um, you know, or anything like that. It's just more, it's just it's just how it's not going to feel or take away from the hunt for you that's right like it doesn't take away you know if i'd shot a 380 point bull as my first bull or if i'd shot a 280 point bull as my first bull like it doesn't take away from the experience or change anything for me it's like did like you know when you first like i'm i'll remember for the rest of my life the first time like the interactions as quick as it was that led up to the moments of me shooting my bull. It's like, I'll remember that to the day I die. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, he's a good representative bull, but he's not like, there's certainly bigger ones. Like, I mean, I saw a bigger one after I left. I also saw like 10 smaller than him. So mm-hmm. it's also like, you know, but yeah. So I, um, yeah, I just wanted a mature bull was what I was there for. And, um, yeah, so I pulled up and there's this little raghorn and there's 10 cows and um, they were feeding off and I looked at the thing and, like I said, I looked up like I was trying to give the example before. They're feeding on a meadow, first light, and um, I looked up on maps and they're feeding off to the right-hand side and I'm like, there is a bench 900 metres away to the direction that they're feeding. And I'm like, that's probably where they're going to bed. And, um, yeah, anyway, I... um, got up there on the meadow and after looking at that meadow, I'm like, holy fucking shit. I didn't see elk. So, and this is like 15 K's down the basin from where I was not even probably, probably 10 K's down the basin from where I was yesterday. So yet the day before I'd gone to the head, I'd maybe seen two elk shits and a couple of elk tracks on this meadow. That was maybe three acres. There was rubs all around it. There would have been 20 rub and it, there was an elk shit every, like if I stood here within a three meter by three meter area, there was another at least two or three elk shits. You know what I mean? You could see where they'd been browsing. You could see where they'd been browsing certain plants. And so for me, that was a massive learning experience of like exactly what good elk fresh sign look like. Definitely. Yeah. This is, okay, it's like you've seen the elk, now go and learn what it looks like if elk are here living. You know what I mean? So it's like, you, you, you've gone from someone that has zero experiences, so let's try and fast track this as quick as possible to be like, okay, you're like back in familiar country about like having a foundation of like, okay, so that's what trees they rub. Okay, you know, that's what time they move off a meadow. First thing you got to pay attention to if you want to be successful over there because normally you kill things in the first hour of light, the last hour of light. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes like a lot of the time also in the middle of the day, I guess too, but it's like when what time does the thermal switch? So mm-hmm. as soon as I was on the mountain, it's like, okay, what times does a thermal switch? When does the, the sun start peeking over the hill? Like, how long have you got? Like, you got to start planning this because when you're chasing something, you know, when you're chasing something up the hill, as the sun's coming over the hill and you're, you're running up the hill and you're like, okay, well, we're getting to halfway up and it's already 6.40 and I know that at 7.15, halfway up, the thermal starts sucking up the hill. So it's like, if you don't think you can kill something in this next 20 minutes, you need to back out right now. Yeah, yeah. Like that's where it's like you need to be, if you want to be successful as a hunter, you need to be super attentive. Mm -hmm. Like you need, you're reading the sign of the animals. You know, you're reading 
what the environment's doing. Like, is it what the weather's doing, what the wind's doing? Like, you've got to, like, it sounds a bit cliche, but it's like you've just got to take it all in, process it, and then you make your decisions off that. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes it's a two-second decision, but that comes from years of experience. Yeah, definitely. Like, hundreds of previous experiences that you're weighing and pulling that information from. And so, for me, I was like, these things are leaving this meadow. Paul Wood said, I can't chase them. They're going into thick as fuck, tight Aspen stuff. I'm like, I'm not going to. I said, I, I'm like, I know that they're here. And from it, what everyone said, if you push elk, you never find them again. So it's like they're leaving. The bull that you want to kill is not with them right now. So why would you go and follow them into this thick as hell shit to try and push me out of a bedding area when the animal you want to shoot isn't even there yet? Mm. So righto. Um, so I actually went and scouted some more country um, and looked at some other spots, found um, some more spots to check, uh, and saw a mountain goat, which was pretty cool. Um, the weather turned really shit, um, and that's the thing. I was on the road that I was coming down, and to be honest, I don't know if my parents listen to podcasts. They probably don't. Um, nearly fucking slipped off a road, off like a proper, like, massive would have been like 500 meter vertical cliff oh. and just being absolutely dead um just the car slipped with, too much as you went around yeah. bend or something like it was so i was up on the mountain and it started hailing but then obviously because i was at such a high elevation and then i'm trying to come down the mountain um and, and yeah then i hit a spot that was all just water but like because it had just been raining like we got like 20 mil in like 15 minutes and so i was like trying to get up there's like water just like flowing down the roads and um yeah all these roads and i just hit this like black soil part and um i was going slow i was going only probably oh, 20 30 k's an hour and should have just been going slower but um yeah ended up just like getting thrown out essentially of the ruts and um yeah, right to the edge of the cliff and pretty well just yeah just fucking luck stopped got like proper cold sweats and went fuck that was close and then um I ended up, yeah, just driving, went back um, and then ended up setting up a camp, not at the campsite. There was like 300 metres from the, the herd, but where they were feeding anyway, but set it up one about a kilometre away and it was like around the edge of the mountain and it was like I figured that they were going to be hitting that meadow at first light, last light and like throughout the night. So I'm like the thermals during that time should be sucking down. So I was like 600 metre 600 feet lower elevation and about a kilometer around the mountain from them, mm -hmm. right? Set up camp there. And then for the Arvo, I went and sat and watched them come out. I only saw four cows instead of the 10 that were there. Um, didn't hear any noise and didn't hear any um, bugling. So the next morning, got up at um, fucking something ridiculous, like three in the morning, had brekkie. And that was the coldest morning I was there. Um, and that was like minus nine. And, um, yeah, I went and sat there with every piece of clothing I had on and sat there in the dark for two hours to hear if the bull that I'd wanted to shoot had rocked up yet. And I didn't hear a bugle. I didn't rip any bugles. And in hindsight, maybe I should have ripped a bugle um, just to sort of spark something up. It's the 7th of September now, off the top of my head, um, or maybe 8th, 7th, no, 5th. It would have been the 8th of September. Um, yeah, nothing happened. And I, um, after about half an hour of first lock, hadn't seen or heard an elk, and I was like, I'm just going to push slowly. Thermals be dripping down. And, um, yeah, I was put in there, and I don't know if the thermals switched or I think – Honest one just caught my movement because I was just rushing because I didn't like, I hadn't seen any sign, hadn't heard anything, had glass to heat. And um, oh, it was just lazy. I had a moment of lapsed concentration and I was like, if I can just walk, like there was a really thick tree that of like looked through multiple times to glass on the hill. And I was like, oh, I'll just like walk from my right. Like I walk, instead of me walking five steps and glassing, I would just walk 15 meters and then stop and then glass the whole face. Mm -hmm. And it's because I'd glassed it maybe 40 times and hadn't seen anything or heard anything. And I was just like, oh, I don't think they're going to be there. And then anyway, they were there and I scared them. Far out. 
And, uh, yeah, it was a bit sort of, I don't know, like it was just a bit like, it was mixed emotions because I was like, oh, well, fuck, it can't be that hard to find out. Like I'd found it just looking off the road on my first day. You know what I mean? Like how hard can it be, really be? Um, Especially with such a big animal. And it's the same for reds, right? You think, you think you're just going to be able to spot them out anywhere, but once they've got their camouflage around them, like their natural environment, their camouflage just oh, kicks in. Yeah. And that's the thing, like, yeah, like you said, it's like, oh, like, you know, there's elk there. You're like, oh, I just saw elk on, but they're like standing in the shade with half a tree covering their body. And you're like, fuck, where are they? And then they walk out three more steps and go into the sun and turn their ass to you. And you're like, holy fuck, I couldn't miss that if I was blind. <laughs> and so anyway, yeah, I scared these elk off this, this meadow and then I walked into the spot that I'd found the day before, which was um four and a half kilometers back off the trail and the way that i found it was i was like i went to the spot where i'd seen the mountain goat and it was a spot that the day before there was five massive meadows up really high in thick bush that had no trails anywhere around it and i was like if i can get here at first light and glass it i might be able to find more elk on these meadows that are like you know six k's away mm-hmm. or whatever like ages away and um try and like then you know do a big 30k drive probably to get around to them and walk in on it but you know i mean i'm like oh like i was trying to use my tactics of being like hey i don't know where these animals are or what they're doing so for me while they're not making noise my biggest asset is my glass in terms of glassing them so i'm like the more country i can see the better and so I found spots in while it was raining and shit. I drove all the roads and found really good spots that I could glass massive amounts of country, and emphasize those meadows. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, I went to there, and then I glassed all these meadows that I thought definitely one of them would have elk on it. Didn't see anything, and I was like, okay. And then I was sitting there and I was look, looking on maps, and one like it was up. It was really weird. I could either side hill it like 1.5 Ks of some of the most grueling, steep, deadfall shit or to this bench that looked really good. Or I could walk up and around on a trail for like 4 Ks and then drop in on it, right? And I was like, I'm going to do that. So I walked in on this trail and then instead of dropping, I sort of dropped, instead of dropping straight down on it, I dropped maybe 700 meters before it. I started sort of angling down onto it onto this bench at an angle. Mm-hmm. And on the top, it was all pretty shit dry country. Um, not a lot of sign, not a lot of rubs. And uh, as soon as I dropped off this side, um, sort of like the south side, I guess, it was all really lush vegetation and, and um, yeah, end up finding an area that had four elk willows on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, like a lot of them, all of them were cloudy. Um, but my issue was the wind was just absolutely atrocious. Like it was blowing because the thermals are like, it should be, it was a pretty hot day. And I'm like, the thermal should just be sucking up here. Like I should be. And I was actually really confident in the sense that it was like, I was glassing heaps. I was walking slow. It was quiet. Like it was just like, I'm going to see Al here and I'm going to kill an Al. Like I was super confident. Like I'm like, if I could pick a setup on how to, if I could write a script on like, how I'm going to do it, this is pretty fucking close. Like I'm, I'm three quarters of the way up a mountain. There's good game trails here because they're good travel corridors. They're good areas where they can feed. Um, I've found these wallows. I can smell elk like multiple times walking these things. I'm like, there has been elk through here today. I found the first wallow, fresh as, been used overnight, if not the morning. Found the next one, right? This hasn't been used for maybe a day or two. Found two more. Fuck, mate. He could have been here an hour ago. Hmm. Like just fresh sign, right? And I'm like, cool, I found another spot, I'm back on elk. But the thing was, the wind, which I think fucked that spot, was up, down, left, right, everywhere. Like, it was everywhere. Yeah. And it dropped down and got to this bedding area, um, and there was elk sign and elk beds everywhere, right? And then there was another bench so, to, and that's the thing for me to walk like 800 meters of wallows and down to that bedding area that was 200 meters long took me four hours. Yeah. Wow. But I was glassing, like I could see 
be probably 100 metres down and I could see about 100 metres in front. But that was the thing. I was like, I'm going to find – like I was in my mind, I was already like the thing that's going to stuff you is if you walk quick and they see you because you you will find elk here. Like there is elk here. It's not like – like there's sometimes when I'm hunting chittle and there's so much sign that I'm like you're missing chittle by not glassing. Mm-hmm. There is there is deer that you're missing better because you're not seeing them. Like I'll tell myself that until I find one, mm-hmm. right? With this elk, I'm like, there is elk in here, in the woods right now around you and you're not finding them, so you need to find them. So you glass more intensely because you are you tell yourself that you're missing them. And it's like, you're like, it's not like, oh, I might find an elk. It's like, no, 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 they're here. Like you now so you just need to find them. Yeah. So... I went to the next bench, which was 500 meters away, and it was complete. It was a, it was a good spot, but it was completely different in the sense of that whole bench was just covered in moose shit. Hmm. Like there was just, and this, this was the thing I didn't even know. I thought that moose shit was just because it's only slightly bigger than an elk, and I mean it is it's considerably bigger. But for some reason, I'm, I thought that moose shit because it's still like a nugget, like it's sort of like half the size of a horse shit. I was like, I thought the moose shit was stag shit. And I'm just like, what the fuck? So I'm trying to put it together and be like, why is heap of elk bedding over there and then the stags come here to bed? You know what I mean? Anyway, I couldn't figure it out until I took I – just, I just kept taking photos and sending it to people. Like send it – and that's what I was doing. I'd take 100 photos in a day and be like, what the fuck's this? What the fuck's this? What the fuck's this? And send it to my – and he'd be like, moose, elk, black bear. Oh, grizz, get out of there. Um, you know. <laughs> but, you know, so he was – he was sending me all this stuff. Um, so I was sending him all that stuff and just trying to, like I said, you're trying to pull information as quick as possible. Like you've only got so much time there. Like, you know, especially on your first trip, it's like just overload, sensory overload dump, just get it all in. You know what I mean? Like the more you can figure out, the more you can process it, the more successful you're going to be. And um, anyway, I ended up finding this really good game trail cutting straight up the ridge from this second bending area. And I'm like, righto. So I'll, walk straight up the ridge it was only oh, 500 meters 600 meters but like pretty steep and it popped out on this massive open like three football field size benches um that were like greenish grass i could see that the elk had been bedding there there was fresh rubs i could smell elk on the bench like they'd been there that morning um but same thing the wind was shit going left right everywhere and then it dropped down onto this next area there was a dead cow elk there that like just skeleton and then there was these really hot like there was these water points with high elevation water and i'm like cool so they've got wallows and beds here they've got a meadow here they're working this triangle and this is where they're living and um so yeah after that i backed out that i spent the whole day in there didn't see any elk didn't hear anything um done a couple of bugles or like a fair bugle bugles and nothing and then that, yeah, backed out. And then I was feeling like, I mean, I was seeing elk, but I was not like, that's that thing. I was, I was like, I just didn't know what to do. And that's where having like a good hunt plan sort of helps. Um, and having like, it's hard to know. Like I'd seen all that sign and like, I guess that's what we're like talking to someone help because I'd gone out and I can't, I'm trying to think exactly I'm sort of dawdling because I'm trying to think what I did. I think I went back to that spot. No, the next morning I went and did a heap of glassing just to make sure that there was no elk on any of those benches. And then I went back to the first spot. No, I didn't. I fucking lie. This is what – no, I did wake up. I woke up super early and I changed spots. Mm -hmm. Because, like, in my mind I'm like I probably pushed them and Just I'm going to the whole area sort of thing. Yeah. I'm like, I think I've sent it elk up out of this area and I'm like, I'm going to give them four or four. I'm like the amount of sign that's here, that's fresh. Like they're living here, but I'm going to give them four or five days and come back in the peak rut. Mm-hmm. Right. And there was another spot, which was a burn that was like 30 K's away that I'd marked. And I'm like, I'm going to go there and I'm going to get up super early at first light. And I'm going to work on the same principle that I've been working on. And that is glass them up right? Like find them. And the thing for me is like, use their assets. You're good at glassing, use that. And I'm like, what's better than going to a massive open burn and trying to glass up animals that are living in the burn. And then they're going into like, you know, there's like areas that 
haven't burnt. And I, I, I went on Google Maps and found all the areas that hadn't burnt and marked all them as the bedding areas. And then I'm like, so what you're going to do is you're going to glass, stop for five minutes, do quick rapid glassing of like silhouettes, good areas, good feed areas, ridges, and just try and find something. And anyway, so the whole first hour of light, did all this glassing, didn't see anything, saw some more moose, um, saw a couple of mule deer does, got to the trailhead, end of the trailhead, and um, there's this guy walking with a bow on his back up to out of camp. And I just said to him, I'm like, hey, man, look, I'm not trying to steal your spot or anything. I just said, is there elk in here? And he turned around and said to me, he goes, mate, I'm hunting bighorn sheep. And he goes, if I was you, he goes, I wouldn't be chasing elk in here. And I was like, right. But he goes, if they're going to be here, he goes, they're going to be where I'm going. There's like a big clump of bush up there and here. He goes, that's where I'd go if I was an elk. He goes, that's where they're going to be living because they jump over from the next basin. And I'm like, right. So I said, look, do you mind? And then we started talking and he was like, oh, I've been hunting for 30 years, fairly successful and stuff. And I said, look, I've been on these guys for three days now do you mind if we just like, if I hike in with you to this spot and I'm, cause he didn't have an elk tag. He just had a bighorn tag. Mm. So I said, do you mind if I come in with you and I, um, I ask you a heap of questions. I'm like, can you even just listen to me at this stage? I hadn't heard a bugle or no one had heard me bugle. So I'm like, can you just hear me bugle and tell me if it's okay? You know, do I sound like a fucking elk? Because like, I've gone to spots that I think they're elk and bugled for three days and not heard a response or heard a bugle. So I'm like, I don't know if I'm doing it wrong. I don't know if I'm doing it right. And there's no elk there. Like, I'm like, I just need to talk to someone, essentially. Yeah. And, yeah, man. He's like, he's like, are you ready? I'm like, well, yeah, my bag's like ready to go. Because I thought, you know, if I see an elk off the road, like, so I parked up and then walked up in with him and we ended up walking in and, um, yeah, actually found some, I spotted a couple of big horn for him and he ended up shooting a pretty good one a couple of weeks later. Um, but yeah, didn't see any elk, but it was just good to like talk to someone about it and like sort of process it. And anyway, that night I was heading out and I went back to Bozeman and stayed at my mate's place and I spoke to him and he said, look, he goes, I showed him photos and he goes, you're right, man. He goes, those elk were there that day. And he goes, you don't leave elk to find elk. And I said, righto. So he goes, if I was you, I'd be going straight back to that spot. So I left there um, early in the morning the next day, drove back to where I was, hiked in the 4Ks, and I started on the meadow that I'd found at the very end up on the top of the ridge where they dropped down to bed and, and wallow and stuff. Got there an hour before dark, listened, didn't hear jack shit. At first light, when I could first start shooting, uh, ripped a couple of bugles and um, yeah, didn't hear anything. Dropped down into the wallows and all the wallows that were fresh were now then like hadn't been touched mm-hmm. since I'd been there. Two days were like all clear. One was like a little bit dirty, but that was like the super fresh one that I'd had. So I don't think anything had been there in two days. Um, yeah, couldn't smell elk anymore. Um, and for me, it was like pretty frustrating in the sense that I mean, yeah, like you'd sort of found this spot and I think the wind on the day that I'd just gone in there and sort of fucked it for me. Yeah. Uh, which, like, which was just frustrating. Um, and I think yet again, like... realistically though, you probably did the best thing, like you did the best that you could have by leaving that spot because you, you're right by saying you, you, the wind was going to mess you up no matter what had happened. Like if you found the elk, then you got too it close. Was just, yeah, it was just a bit of combination of like, <clears throat> like if, it's not like, it sounds maybe a bit cocky, but it's like, I, I was like, put it this way. If I'd gone in there the first time ever and the wind was just blowing up like it typically does, mm-hmm. right? And I know the mountains are like notoriously shit, but I mean, like it was actually a clear blue sky day, like actually fairly hot. Um, and so for once the thermal was actually should have just gone typical, like, you know, just up in the middle of the day and down in the arvo. And I'd only got there like sort of at nine in the morning. So, I mean, like it should have just been pretty good. But yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was just shit all day. And it wasn't like, oh, you're in the shade. It was just like it's going to blow like across the ridge and then down the ridge and then up the ridge and then back. And then like it was just blowing all four directions. 
Um, and so, and especially like when you're in thickish tim, like it was open enough that I could see well where you could see an ass or a head that, you know, like I said, a hundred, but it was like not open enough that you can just like stroll through there and not risk putting shit up. Like it was perfect stalking if the wind was good and it just wasn't. And so, and like I said, I just knew I put up animals because I could smell them and see the sign. Like there was so much rubs. Oh, one thing that was really, really cool. I found um, a heap of velvet on one of the trees. That's sick. So I found where I must've been, cause it was fresh. It must've been a moose. Um, I reckon. Cause it was too like too fresh for it to be an elk, but yeah, I reckon I found like where a um a moose had just rubbed up. Oh, sorry, That's heap right. of um velvet. Oh, like I said, man, fifteen hour day, I'm trash. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I um yeah, like that was pretty cool. But yeah, it was just disheartening. So I went back to Bozeman, and um Nick Nick was actually sitting in my ear because I was talking to him, and he's like fucking hell man he's like just go into the back country he's like you will find bulls like they will be bugling like go into the back country and i was like okay and my mate had actually been into this spot a couple of times and shot like a pretty good bull there with the bow and um he was like he'd sent me a couple of pins and he's like i'd walk in here if you walk in on trail 4ks um and then he goes i would camp here and then he goes you'd hike down and do all this and he sent me a spot of a bench where he had a, he'd had a bull bedded the day the uh, sorry the year before, and so I stayed at his place and then the next morning picked up a few more supplies and then I left got to his uh, got to the spot and um, I walked in with what was going to be five days worth of hunting and food and um, yeah so walked in probably would have been pretty heavy uh, I reckon I would have been maybe. Oh, 20 because I had a lot of cam- like I actually did have a fair bit of camera gear and all the rest of it, maybe like 26 or 7 kilos. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I mean, yeah, it's not a heat, but it was all like it was a yeah, 4k walk purely all uphill, there was no downhill. Um, so yeah, I was pretty rat shit by the time I got in and um, yeah, set up camp, um, really important feature that you need to do is tie your food away um from you and so yeah previously before that i said that i was going to touch on this but yeah previously before that, obviously every day i was just doing day stuff so i'd come back sleep in the car or when i set up the camp i was sleeping and um and yeah just always had the food in the car i had no food in my tent um at all whatsoever toothpaste electrolytes nothing nothing at all like the only thing i'd bring into my tent was water and that had Never had electrolytes in it. That had never had electrolytes near it. It was like, yeah, just water. Um, I had a pistol. I had a forty-four mag um, that a mate lent me. In hindsight, I'll probably never get a pistol again. Um, there's really conflicting stuff, but if you, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know if you, like, I never saw a grizz, so it's hard to comment. But like, all the dudes that I spoke to. You know, like you could, yeah, you're going to get, you're going to get messed up. If a grizzly wants to attack you, you're going to get messed up. Yeah. Whether you, if you're, if you're shooting with a 44 or whatever, like you're probably going to get messed up if it wants you. Whereas with the bear spray, if it really wants you and you hold your ground and like really proper, like I accidentally fucking shot some off because just doing like a practice test and I shot like a, 2% 2% dose of what, like it was like a, and the wind was going the wrong way. So it blew back in my face. Oh my God. <laughs> Fucking. And from that point on, I'm like, yeah, man, bear spray. Like it was terrible. Like imagine getting pepper, mixing it with chili and making it into a spray. That's what it was like. It was just like irritation. Yeah. Like just, to put it into, it was just painful. And anyway, I was like, like my eyes were watering, my nose was watering. It's like, I felt like my skin, like it was just, oh, like, and that was like, not, that wasn't, even, that was like an accidental, like, like not even a, the full bit of bloody bear spray. So that's where I'm like, hey, I'm like, I walked around with the 44 in the top hood of my exo pack. The only time I was like, I'm going to take my pistol out 
and not like I had my bear spray. People don't, I'm pretty open, dude. But if I was, it was on my bino harness. If I was taking a piss, shit, fucking getting changed, take off my backpack and having a break, my bino harness and that bear spray. If I was taking my bino harness off, it was in my pocket. Mm-hmm. It never left my side. And you can't, you've got to be, it's the same, it's unforgiving. Like, it's not like, oh, bloody, whatever. Like, it will, it's literally going to save your life. Like, you have to be so diligent, like, that make sure you've got it at all times. And, um, yeah, so I, um, yeah, I carried bear spray and a pistol, but the pistol, like I said, was mainly for, like, that carcass and the walk out. Um, like, obviously, walking back in on meat that you've got hung, yeah. you want to, um, it was more just like, you know, if they were like, yeah, if you're like 100 metres away and there's a grizzly on the guts but your meat's like where you are, you don't want them coming over trying to get all thin, you can like fire shots at them and obviously bear spray is like not going to work at that distance. But, um, yeah, if I was, I mean, like I said, I'd lucky to have a pistol but in the future I wouldn't stress about it and just bear spray, and, you know, is fine. So you did a little open loop there before because you talked about bringing in five days of food and uh... – Mm. having it just near, next to tent, did something get into it? No. So um, I'm saying don't put it anywhere near tent. Yeah. So yeah, my food, like, yeah, yeah, my food, like I hung it about 150 metres from my tent in a tree. Yeah, okay. Like, I thought like, you were going to get it like, yeah, something came and got it. And I was like, no. Five, five metres off the ground. No, no, no. I was like super, super cautious and super, um, yeah, I am. Um, and that's the thing, like people paint it. Like I was in, I was pretty close to Yellowstone in like a pretty high grizz. Like I was telling people where I was going hunting roughly and they're like, you are fucking mad. <laughs> like to put it into perspective, they're like, dig yourself a grave. It's going to be easier. Like wow. you're not, you know, like that's, and that's the level of like, um, yeah, a lot of grizz. But in the same sense, it's also super low density um because that's the thing like you talk to guys that hunt those areas all the time and you're like hey i'm in a big basin like i said it's two k's wide three k's wide by seven eight k's long right and i mean those figures to most people don't sound big but it's like that's four just as that's probably thirty thousand acres worth of hunting in one basin yeah Yeah. yeah hills streams gullies like little you know crevasses that it's like and then you talk to people and you're like how many grizz do you think would be in this basin and they're like maybe one half the time or you know three quarters of the time Mm. so it's like it is it's more just the repercussions of running into one are like you know super high yeah like you run into one they're generally pretty like you run into a black bear from what everyone says, you know, like you can still get messed up, but it's like they're not looking for a scrap. Mm-hmm. They, a sow with cubs, she might be a bit confrontational. She might come in, but it's like if you come across a grizz with cubs, she's going to be super, super. That's the two scenarios I was worried about was sow with cubs, grizz, or me killing my animal and then like in the period of me butchering it and or me coming back to the carcass constantly to get meat him or her being like, no, mate, this is my carcass. Yeah, and then like yeah. me, like uh, me having a confrontation then. So that were my two big concerns, like just popping over a hill and finding a grizz. Like, I mean, yeah, it happens, but it's like super low density, not really likely. It's like, you know, you popping over a hill and finding a grizz, yeah, that's going to be shit. But it's like if she's got two cubs too and they're right next to her and you're at like 30 metres, it's like Becomes you better. reason to attack. Like, you might better start thinking real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I backpacked into this spot, got into this spot at like four in the Arvo, set up camp, hung my food, like I said, 150 meters away. <laughs> and I um, actually dropped down to the, the spot where I um, I saw the bull. And I'm uh, sorry, where the, um, he'd seen the bull the year before my mate. But the thing was I dropped down like 1,800 vertical feet in like an hour. Um, And that might not sound like a lot, but so I went down, checked this bench, and there was a bit of elk sign on it, but 
nothing fresh and there was no bulls, did some bugling, didn't hear anything back. And um, 